Good evening and welcome to Let's Study the Word. I'm your host, Minister Dr. Karen Powell, and I know tonight we have a word from the Lord. So one more time, we go into the word to get a word. Let us pray. Abba Father, Jehovah Jireh, the one who lives and moves and have our being. Lord, as we come tonight, we come mighty God because we need a word from you. Lord, we have so many buts that may be taking place in our individual lives. So many circumstances that are hitting us from the right, from the left, from the east, from the west, from the north, and from the south. Lord, decisions to be made. Situations and circumstances that have us backed up. And Lord, we can't even think. We don't know what direction to turn. And so, Lord, tonight we come to you, for we lift up our eyes to the hills from whence come to our help, because we know that our help comes from you. And so, Lord, we want to tell you thank you, that you are the God who hears, you're our Abba Father, and you will answer prayer. Take full control of the session tonight as we go into your word. Give us a rhema word to keep us for this season. Thank you, Daddy. In your son's name we pray. Amen and amen. Good night, everyone. And we are back to week two of our conclusive conclusion to the session, the bot, the man, the servants, the prophets, and the God of these crossroads. And if you didn't join us, for week one, feel free to go to the YouTube page, Let's Study the Word, L-E-T apostrophe S, Study the Word, where the session is loaded up, and it's also on my personal Facebook page, Karen Paul. So, let's get into the Word. So, we were using 2 Kings 5 as a launching pad for this study, and in our first session, for those who have missed it, we examined the bots that occurred within the story. And we identify that what are those circumstances which kind of want to complicate your life. Yeah, you know, those things that people look at and think that you have it all going on and everything is right. But in your story, in the background, you've got that situation. You know, like how Paul had that thorn in the flesh, even while he was establishing churches, even while he was preaching the gospel and everything looked nice on the outside. But on the inside, he struggled with the circumstances, with this situation that was his butt. Sometimes butts are simply decisions that you need to make, whether to go left, whether to go right, whether to go forward or to stand still. Yeah, th those are butts. But sometimes our situations that we have to deal with, like sickness and, and disease and, and family problems and relationships that, you know, just got you bogged down and got you anxious. Yeah, all of those are your buts. And it's these buts that, you know, they, they seem to come at us in this storm. And when they come, you're usually at a crossroads because the decision you take will lead you one way or the other. And we identified a number of these buts in this story taken from 2 Kings chapter 5. And you know what? Let's just read a few verses from 2 Kings chapter 5. Um, let's start reading at verse 9. So verses 1 to 8 tells us how Naaman the prophet, that Naaman, sorry, Naaman, the commander of the army of Syria, we learn that he's this mighty man of valor. We learn that he is respected by his king. We learn that he has it all looking good. But then he has a butt. And we learned that his butt was that he had leprosy. So he's come to the king of Israel because a servant girl said, you know, there is a prophet in Israel who could do something about your butt. So he comes down and he goes to the king of Israel and the king starts saying, is this man mad? Why is this king of Syria sending his servant to me to heal? What does he know about me? Am I God that I can heal? But there was a prophet who knew a God. And so the prophet says, why are you distressing yourself? Why are you tearing up your clothes? You know, send him to me so that he too can know there's a prophet in Israel. So we pick up at verse nine and we'll continue down to maybe about verse 15. Let, let's take a look. 
So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him <laughs> to say, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleaned. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he'd surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and, you know, kind of wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. Are not Abana and Pahar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? And so he's mentioning rivers that they have in Syria. Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? So he went off in a rage. Like verse 13. Name and servants. Yeah, you remember servants? Yeah, the line. Went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash, be cleansed. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. And Naaman and all his attendants, so there was a crowd of witnesses, went back to the man of God. And he stood before him and said, now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. Let's go down a little bit more. The prophet answered and said, as surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. So he wanted some soil. For your servant will never again make burnt offering and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. So he wanted the soil to go home and use it to make a, a, an altar. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master, that's the king of Syria, enters the temple of Remyon to bow down and he's leaning on my arms and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Remyon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. So basically he's saying, when I go, don't, don't think that it is that I'm going and I'm bowing and I'm bowing to Remyon. I'm bowing to hold my master's position, you know, to, to keep my, my role in his life. I'm just bowing out of courtesy. I'm bowing because the king is beside me and the king is bowing and I should be higher than the king. So Elisha says to him in verse 19, go in peace, Elisha said. And we stop right there, verse 19. A good place to stop. So now that you've read the ending of the story, let's go back to the top of the story and just talk about those books. So we have Naaman, the command of the Syrian army, we seen as a great man. He has a problem that money and power can solve. And we said that this problem was leprosy. The next thing that the scripture told us was that this Gentile, this commander of the army of Syria, goes up against the people of God. And the Lord gives victory to him. Now that's the second book that we saw earlier in the story. So, but number one is that he's got a problem that money and power that he has can't solve. But number two is that this is a conundrum because a Gentile is getting victory over the people of God. And the Lord is the one who is giving this victory. That's something, something seems off right there. The third book we saw was that the scripture this defines Naaman as a mighty man of valor. And this is interesting because only five people in the scriptures have been described with this title. And he is the only one who's been a Gentile. And if you don't hear the names of the other persons, then you need to go back and watch last week's episode where we went into detail, not only about the name and the persona, but we looked at the characteristics of each individual that allowed them to be described as a mighty man of valor. Why is it important that you know this? Because you want to be called a mighty man or a mighty woman of valor. So because you want this upon your own life, you need to see what it is that you need to display. 
so that you can be named to a mighty man of valor. Now, those were the books of the story earlier. Now we start to, started to talk about the servants in the story. And there's this particular Jewish maid who has been taken as a slave from Israel when Naaman had gotten victory over Israel. So when the Syrian army had gone up against Ahab, they had won the battle, as we mentioned, and they had taken some slaves back to their homeland. And one of the slaves was this young girl who now serves Naaman's wife. And she too has a vote because as a slave, you've lost everything that you knew. You, you, you're no longer in a place of comfort. You no longer have your freedom. So typically you're supposed to be bitter and hurting but instead of being bitter and hurting, she was looking at her master and she was providing a healing salve to a hurting family. His wife was hurting, Naaman was hurting about this leprosy that they had no power over, but she knew where power resided. And so here it is, this family is at the crossroads of their lives, victorious but defeated victorious but hurting, victorious but scorned, great in the eyes of a king, but not so welcomed in the house of a papa because he's a leper. And so here it is, there is this young girl who provides an answer at this crossroad. He then mentioned that Naaman carries the letter back to the king of Israel, and he too has a crossroads because he thinks that the king of Syria is king of war with him. Because he's like, am I God? No. You're not God, Jehovah. But you know someone who is connected to a God. And what is surprising for me was that a slave who was now living in Syria knew about the God and the connection with the prophet and knew the king started tearing your clothes and started worrying about me, myself, and I, and what am I going to do without even remembering that there was a prophet who knew what to do. Now, the king of Syria, Naaman, may have been great strategists who understood how to win wars, but they were not so very brilliant when it comes to a young girl's words because she never mentioned that the king was the one who had the answer. She was very clear that there is a prophet who had the answer. But maybe they weren't so silly after all because if you think about it, from one king to another king, you're not asking him to heal. You're saying, I know the answer resides in your hand. So what can you do? But Jehovah, he didn't take it that way. You know what that is? Pride. Pride of life. Yeah, that's what it really is. Because you're taking on the things of God unto himself. So he, he, that book in his life was caused purely because he was looking at himself as the answer. When we know that he has no answer. So those are the persons with the books. Then we looked at the man, and we said the man is the central character of his own story. You're the man in your story. Naaman was the man in his story. I am the man in my own story. And understand, man is not indicative of gender or race or creed. It's simply the individual who is standing at the center of their butts. So whatever the butt is, the person who is most impacted, the person who is at the center, the core of that butt, that's the man. So we said there were the bots and there were the man. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this man, Naaman, who is at his butt, has been described as a man of valor. So what were some of the things that we could conclude based on last week's session that he would exhibit? Well, we said that one character, Gideon, was a man who went out in strength, but he relied on the strength of God. So he went out in what strength he had, knowing that it certainly was not going to be enough, but relying on the strength of God. We then said that Jephthah 
was one who had to learn how to let go of his hurts in order to live in the future, in order to live in his present. You've got to let go of the past. You can't keep holding on to it. The other thing we said, like David, character there for him was that he, you should not be focusing on self and promotion for yourself. Instead, you should be focused on doing the will of God. And then we looked at Jeroboam, who we said, God knows he can entrust you with much. That's why he got 11 tribes, but 10 tribes first, and one tribe, Benjamin, who came with him originally and switched later. And if you want to hear the story about the splitting of Israel, yeah, you got it. Go back to last week's message. And the final of the fifth person was El Siedia. And he, from his character, we learned that you need to stand with and for men of God. Let me say that again. To be a man of valor, you've got to stand with and you've got to stand for other men of God. So we discussed the bots, we discussed the men. Now, have you ever been in a situation where a bot has interrupted your life? Think about it. Whatever the situation is, I want you to steadily daily bring it to mind. You got it? All right. Now I want you to think about persons who came around you while you were going through that bot. And these persons, this supporting cast, if you want to call it so if your life was a movie, were your servants. There are main characters in their own stories, in their own tales, but in your story, they come in to serve you. And in addition to the servants, you also have some prophets. Now, we highlighted last week that there's nothing demeaning about the word servant. And when we, when we talk about people coming in to serve you, and if you think you're serving someone in their butt situation, it's not demeaning. In fact, Jesus came and he served. And we saw him in operation. We watched him watch his disciples feet. We watched him heal. That's serving. We watched him die on the cross so that you and I could be here free this evening. That's serving. And so... As the greatest example of servant leadership, we want to reflect on his character of servanthood and feel free to serve. Some of us are so caught up in our own butts and in our own circumstances that we can't even see that we hold the answer to somebody else. Amen. So this week, we're going to take a closer look now at the servant. So last week we did the butts and we did the man. This week, we're going to look at the servants the prophets, and the God of the cross. So let's talk about that maid that we mentioned earlier. One, we don't know her name. We know a little bit about her circumstances. We know that she's a Jew. We know she was taken in the war against Syria. We know she's being held as a captive. Imagine being uprooted from everything you know and you have been accustomed to from being able to go to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. Hey, that's not hard to imagine because that's what COVID has done to us. It has uprooted everything that we knew as norm. So you used to be able to go to church and worship as you wish. Not so much anymore. Depending on which country you're in, you may be limited to 10, 30, none. Yeah. You may be used to going to work as you normally choose to. Not so much anymore certain number of persons within the household. So your butt has this circumstantial evidence of changing your life in a way that it blows your mind. And when she's brought to Syria, whatever was her original condition, she's now consigned to the role of maid servant. But she would have been raised on the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She would have been raised on the stories of Israel escaping from Egypt and the miracle of crossing the Red Sea. She would have been told the tales of the fall of the walls of Jericho. But her stories had no such miracles, no such deliverance. And the indignity of her circumstances is that even after the war ended, the war has ended now, there's peace now between Syria and Israel. She remains a slave. And there's little or no hope for a change. And to add to the humiliation, 
for the context of this message, she is nameless and so she's faceless. So this nameless, faceless foreigner is serving the enemy and she will become the vessel of deliverance for him. She who had no might, no authority, no power of her own. She who is not even considered, you know, a great warrior. Is now the vessel through whom the warrior will be delivered. I bring this out because supporting cast members, me, you, as we operate in life, we need to learn how to depend on the strength of God in order to survive. That, that's what being a woman or a man of valor is about. Surviving on God's strength. This maiden had to demonstrate these characteristics of valor. She had to let go of her past and learn to live in her present so that she could survive and even survive into the future. Even though miracles were not occurring in her own life, she still had to hope in the God of Israel. And when she speaks, it's not about securing a release or saying, well, maybe if I let him know about this answer, he will let me go back to Israel. No, it's about compassion. It's about knowing that the life of the man can change. Do you see all the characteristics of the man of valor coming out in her life as a supporting character in Naaman's story? The man who is called the mighty man of valor has a maid who is displaying those same characteristics because she has her own story and she too can be considered a mighty character of valor. Now, if you think about it, Jesus had his own supporting cast. I, I wanted to preach this word for a long time and I have never got the chance, but imagine Jesus between the two Johns. Uh, the scholars, you get it? Jesus between the two Johns. For there was a John who announced the start of his ministry, John the Baptist. John the Baptist announced, look, here cometh he who I am not fit to tie his shoe. Remember, as Jesus approached them in the river. And he says, no, I, I can't baptize you, Jesus. And Jesus says, yeah, that's your role. This is the start of my ministry. And so John baptizes Jesus. That's John. And then while Jesus is on the cross, whipped, beaten, hurting, looking down, he sees his mother. And tradition tells us that by this time, Joseph had died. I don't know if you knew that, but Joseph had died. And so she's standing there and his concern at that moment was not even for himself. He was looking at his mother and he was concerned. And so he looked at John, the beloved, John, the disciple, John who laid his head upon Jesus's breast, John who he told the story, John was accompanying him throughout the three years of his ministry. And he says, John, behold thy mother. Mother, behold thy son. The two Johns. Those were his supporting cast. And if you think about it, Elijah had a Elisha. Moses had a Joshua and a Caleb. And when he came to battle, he had a Joshua and an Aaron. Different people support you at different points in your life, at different levels. Do not despise them because their roles, whether servants or prophets, are important. Think about the other servant, the one who may not have been the guide to the prophet, may not have been the one like the maid who gave the direction to go, but it was another servant who subdued Naaman's pride. Remember, we read it tonight, starting at verse nine. Naaman was all up in himself, up in his emotion, me, Go deep in the dirty Jordan. But it was a servant who more than likely was a slave. I don't know if he was a Jew or another type of Gentile. But it was that servant who was the voice of reason. And notice 
he was a smart, intelligent man because he didn't just look at him and say, Master Neyman, you're being an idiot. <laughs> I'm sure that may have run through his mind. But he said, Father, subduing himself, coming from a voice of reason, coming as a child, speaking to a father, coming as one less than saying, think about what it is that you're about to do. There's some servants, some friends who are going to tell you the truth even when you do not want to hear it. Value them. These are the ones who stand to both announce that there's a representation of God on the earth, but also the ones who will warn you to say, listen, stop. Think about what you're going to do. Drawbricks, are you sure you want to go down this road? We're talking about servants. Who are the servants in your life? Who are the servants? Have you said thank you recently? Have you prayed for those who serve you? At this point, I want to pinpoint the prophet. Now, bear in mind, we've already discussed the fact that Jehovah was not the author or the vessel through which healing would come because healing doesn't come through man, it comes through God. So even the healing did not come really through Elisha. He was a vessel to release the answer to the healing, which comes from God. As powerful as Jerome was as king of Israel, he did not have the power to heal. And as I thought about it, as I reflected on that scripture, you know, my mind went to a place where you don't want to go, but it's the truth. Many people come to ministries and to churches and to particular churches because they're seeking a healing. They're not really seeking a healer. They want, they want a healing. And I want to pinpoint that no matter who this pastor, who this bishop is, who this man of God is, as much as he may heal this person and that person, he may not be the vessel of your healing. You've got to understand that because healing comes from God. He's the one who determines who gets healed and who does not and when it occurs. Remember, we spoke about Paul and the thorn in his flesh. He had to die with it. It never went away. The second point in the message is that the young maid message, her message had become distorted in the transmission. But in the end, the prophet understood who he was. So while the king is there tearing his clothes and going on with the hype and, oh, what am I to do? Prophet understood his role in this and says, tell the man that there's a prophet in Israel. So if you're listening to this message, more than likely you're not drawn to hype and to the things that pull people to ministry of healing and deliverance. You're drawn to the word because not many people are going to sit down and go into the word to get a word. You're one of the extraordinaries. You're one of those called out ones. You're one of those that Psalm 119, 11 states, you have stored up the word in your heart so that you might not sin against God. Two different categories of these. Yeah, yeah, I know we still love the healing and we love to see somebody get healed and clap, but what we're drawn to is word. And why we're drawn to word is because we know that someone can get healed and still go to hell. How many times have we heard, Lord, if you just touch me, I will serve you all the days of my life. And then they're back in the dance hall or they're back into sin. Because that's the reality. People want healing, but they don't want the healer. So here it is. King has rented his clothes. I don't have the answer. The prophet says, send him to me that I may let him know that there is a prophet. And he comes now to meet with the prophet and the prophet sends out a messenger. I found that so interesting. And Naaman is rightly upset because he's an emissary from the king of Syria. And I have come to the king 
and the king has directed me to you and you don't even come out to me, you send a servant to come and acknowledge me. And the message is, go deep in Jordan, dirty, dirty Jordan. Now, he wouldn't understand that as a Jew, the prophet really couldn't come out in the presence of a man who is leprous. That's instructed in Exodus. That's why those who were Jews who were lepers had to be put outside the camp. They couldn't intermingle with the camp. No, Naaman's situation was a little different because as a Syrian, they didn't have these strict religious rules about lepers or sins or diseases of the skin. And it's interesting to me that the message that he gets says, dip in the Jordan seven times. The number seven speaks to completion. The Lord created the heavens and the earth in seven days. But think about what the word said that we read earlier. It did not just say that you will be healed, your flesh will be restored. The prophet said, if you dip seven times in the Jordan, your flesh will be restored and you will be clean. Now, automatically, you're thinking maybe that the clean is the removal of the leprosy from the body. But I want to propose to you that I don't think so. I think the restoring of the flesh is the healing. But I want to propose that the clean, you will become clean, is speaking to a spiritual clean. Think about it. Here it is, Naaman is standing in his prompt and pride. What was the sin in the Garden of Eden? The sin was the loss of the flesh, the pride of life. And what was the other one? You need to go back and watch the earlier episodes <laughs> or the earlier series. Loss of the flesh, pride of life, and the loss of the eyes. Now, pride of life is, is about being haughty and proud, thinking that he was too big to follow the instructions of the prophet. You know, the man who has the answer to your situation. Pride of life is that I, I don't want to do this. There are cleaner waters in my country. But none of those waters would make him healed or spiritually clean. It would make him physically clean, but it wouldn't have healed him or changed him spiritually. Naaman had an ego problem. He had a pride problem. Now, here it is that he faces this problem of pride. And so the prophet had to address it. Now, how do I know this? Do you remember the story when Nathan goes to David after David has sinned by one, lusting after Bathsheba, two, sleeping with Bathsheba and committing adultery, three, killing Bathsheba's husband so that he wouldn't have to have to be held accountable because he got her pregnant. And Nathan comes to him, Nathan comes to him and he says, you know, I want to tell you the story about this man. You know, he has one little sheep and then there's this man with a whole lot of sheep and then the man with the holy for sheep, steal the man with the one little sheep sheep. What do you think? And David said, what a wicked, cruel fellow. Tell me who he is, let me put him to death. And Nathan says, you're the man. You have all these many wives, you have all these many concubines, and the poor man had one wife and you're taken. And he cries out, the prophet showing, holding, accountable, loss of the flesh lust of the eyes, pride of life. I am king, so whatever I want, I should get. Nathan holds the mirror to David's face and David in seeing himself falls before his face. And that's when he wrote Psalm 51. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. It's one of the, the most favorite Psalms because he says, cleanse me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me. Now, Nathan, Naaman does not have that background. He doesn't have that background, that understanding. So when the prophet says to him, dip and you will be healed and you'll be clean, he's still stuck in this moment of pride. He's still stuck in this war with his flesh until a servant gives him the right answer. Until a servant was bold and brave enough to say, Master, are you sure you want to go down this road? 
dip seven times, is complete. The action becomes complete and he is physically healed. What I like about Naaman, he could have gotten up out of the Jordan and just headed home, excited to tell his wife to show his friends that his skin, to show his king that his skin was clean. But you remember those 10 lepers who went before Jesus and asked, Jesus, can you heal us? And Jesus says, go and show yourself to the prophet. Yeah. And on their way, they realize that they have been healed. One turns back and he goes to Jesus and says, thanks. Naaman goes to the prophet and he says, thanks. He says, thanks. And this time when he goes to the prophet with his entourage, Elisha comes out and meets with him. It's an acknowledgement that he's truly clean. Because like those 10 lepers, you can't go before the prophet unless you are truly clean. You can't go to the leader of the temple unless you're truly healed. And when he offers financial blessings, the prophet wants to remind him that this is not something you can buy. This is not something you can earn. This is not something the king could have done. It's not something your king could have done. It's not something I did. It's from God. So thank you, but no thank you. Keep your money, keep your garments. And it was this, I believe, that was the final nail that drove home to Naaman that there is a God and this God is in Israel. And he says it because he says, I have come to believe on Jehovah. And I've come to believe in him so much that my altar when I go home will be from the very dirt of Israel. I want a representation of your God in my country. And that's where I'm going to offer my burnt offering. That's where I'm going to offer my burnt sacrifices. And if I even go into Rimeon's temple and my master is bowing so I have to bow because I can't be higher. Know this. It's not out of worship. It's just out of respect because I now know that there is only one God and he's found in Israel. Now, there's another servant <laughs> who comes into the picture at this point. We didn't read his part of the story. And one of these nights I'm going to preach about him. His name is Gehazi and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, you know, rose up into this servant who is serving the prophet. He's a servant to the prophet. And so I want to point out to you that lust of flesh and pride of life and lust of the eyes is not limited to people who are outside the temple. It's, it, it happens to even us as Christians. How we deal with it, how when that becomes the butts of our crossroads, how we handle it is altogether another story. And here's a story where he's no longer the supporting cast, but the main character is one we'll look at one of these days. But it came upon him so much that when he heard Naaman make the offer to the prophet and the prophet said no, well, he decided he wanted it. And his story, we'll talk about it. So now we're at the crossroads. Naaman is healed. For him, the thorn of his flesh has been removed. He has encountered the real and true God. I don't want us to consider a couple of things. Why Naaman? Why not a Jewish leper? Are, are, were there lepers in, in, in Israel? Jesus actually said it. There are many lepers in Israel, but the only one God chose to heal was Naaman. That's in the New Testament. Homework for next week. You go find it. I'll hold you accountable. I've not been given homework for about five weeks now. I don't know what happened, but homework for next week. And don't shout it if you know it next week. Write it down. Were there not other lepers? Oh, yeah. There were lepers in Israel. Why Naaman? Why would God want to have this encounter with this Syrian? I want to point out that God knows our end from our beginnings. He knew what an encounter with Naaman would result in. You know, just like how God knew that Jacob would des desire the birthright. I mean, Esau may have been born with the birthright, 
But Jacob had a greater desire for the birthright than Esau. And so, you know, in Malachi chapter one, it says, God loves Jacob and Esau, he hated. And it's repeated in Romans chapter nine, where it says, God loves Jacob, Esau, he hated. And it is because of a purpose of election. He chooses. That's what it boils down to. Naaman was elected. God will bless who we will choose to bless. That's what Romans 9, 18 tells us. And why dip in the Jordan? Why not pray a hundred times? Why not up a hundred bullocks? Why not go slay some enemy for Israel's sake? Why, why this dirty river? I've seen Jesus heal people just by saying, be thou healed. And I've seen him spat upon the dirt to make a muddy clay mixture to put it on the eyes of another. And that's how they get healed. Because God will use simple things to confound the wise. That's who he is. And for Naaman, choosing a dirty river allowed pride to be exposed. Because when the servant said it to him, he suddenly recognized that he was being proud and foolish. And so he had to shed that pride and learn to lean on someone else. And in this case, he learned to lean on Israel's God. Have you been brought to your knees at these crossroads of life and you're wondering what to do? Jeremiah chapter six says, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way and walk therein, and you shall find rest your soul. Say it again. Stand in the way. See, look, ask for the old paths. Identify what are the good ways. And when you've identified, walk in it and you'll find rest for your soul. What does that mean? Firstly, we need to stand still. Anxiety is a killer. Making hasty, rash decisions is the worst possible thing you can do. Think about the man that shot his son and almost drove over him. Stand still. If he had just stood still and just stopped, people who have killed their children, people who have killed their girlfriends, people who have killed their wives and their husbands, it all happens in a moment. And they'll tell you, I don't even know what happened because we are so busy reacting. We're so caught up in our emotions that we make rash decisions at these crossroads. You're at the crossroads. You look left, there is a road. You look right, there is a road. You look straight ahead, there is a road. The one straight ahead is narrow and bumpy. Right or left is smooth, you turn smooth. But hold on, is that where you ought to be going? No, stand still. Allow yourself to hear the voice of God. Remember, that's what Elisha had to hear when he was in the cave. He was so caught up in his emotions. Oh, Jezebel is going to kill me. That until God got him to stay still in the cave, he could not hear the voice of God. When you're at the crossroads, stand still. As much as possible, Put the box out of your mind. I know it is hard. It is not easy. But cover your mind. Cover your mind. Cover your mind. How do you cover your mind? You pray, play praise and worship songs. You play the word. You speak to servants who are going to give you good counsel, wise counsel. People who are going to speak the word of God to you and at you. Don't get caught up in the butt. Get caught up in the word. Second thing. Remember, that's what Jeremiah 16 is telling us. Remember, remember, what are you remembering? Jeremiah 6 is reminding you that the old and reliable paths you have taken previously were the best paths. These were the times when you trusted God and you were led by him. Some of the roads were narrow, some of them were a little wider, but when you learn not to lean to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, he directed your path. There are over 140 verses 
a scripture that says, remember. When Jesus was having that last supper and he brought the bread and he shared the wine, he said, do this in remembrance of me until you come. Revelation 2, 5, it entreats us, remember even where we are fallen. So not just remember the good things, but even remember the bad things, the cures where you're fallen, so you can repent, turn, and do better. Remember. It's a silly man who makes a mistake, sees the mistake, sees the result of the mistake, and go and make the same mistake again. It's silly. Remember. And the third thing is, when you stand, when you think and remember and be counseled, walk worthy of the gospel. Philippians 1.27. What does walk worthy of the gospel mean? Bear fruit in your deeds and your actions. So whichever direction you're going to turn, whichever road you're going to take at this crossroads, make sure it will yield good fruit. Then make sure that you are going to be growing in the knowledge of God or the knowledge of God is going to grow you. So you're growing in or you're growing by the knowledge of God. Remember when last week we spoke about um, Solomon and Solomon says to God, I'm a young child, I've come and I, I know I'm king and I'm to lead your people up. God, I, I don't know how to do this. Give me wisdom, knowledge and understanding. And he grew in the knowledge of God and not only grew in the knowledge of God, but the knowledge of God gave him wisdom beyond his measure. So he was able to confound women fighting over a baby. He was able to confound kings and queens who came to visit him and ask and pose questions and concerns to him. He, he grew in and by the knowledge of God because those type of knowledge is not head knowledge. It comes from a higher source. And be strengthened, be strengthened. When you're at the crossroads, be strengthened. When you've got that butt, be strengthened with the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. That's what they had to learn in the upper room. They were at a crossroads. Jesus had died, he had been resurrected, he had come and walked again with them, and now he had left them and he told them to tarry and wait. So they were standing still and they were waiting and they were remembering, and then he pours out the anointing upon them and they're strengthened with all power. And when you're strengthened, give thanks. Give thanks. No, the thorn may not have come out of your flesh yet, but give thanks. No, the, the circumstances not fully worked out yet, but give thanks. The financial situation, the, the bind that you're in has not been worked out yet. Don't worry about it. Give thanks. I remember when I was in similar binds, all of those situations, and I had to learn to give thanks. What's your story? Remember, you're the main character. What's your story? Who have you surrounded yourself with as servants? Will they direct you in the word of God or will they direct you to God? Will they tell you the truth about your actions and your answers and your decisions? Hmm? Those are serious questions to ask yourself and only you can answer them. Do you have a prophet in your life who will lay hands on you and tell you the truth like Nathan did with David or one who will see pride and sin in you and help you to become stripped and rubbed down because they want what is best for you. Not just the healing of your flesh, but they want the healing of your soul. Because guess what? You can go to heaven with a broken body, but you can't go to heaven with a broken soul. Every one of us, in one way or the other, we are at a crossroads. We are in a both situation. We're in a conjunction of choices and we can only look to God for an answer. Stand still, remember, and walk worthy into your future. What's the man, the servants, the prophets, and most importantly, there is a God of the crossroads. Yeah, life may seem confusing and crazy, but just be still and know that he is God. And walk into your victory by giving thanks and confessing. 
I want to thank you. <laughs> the fact is that you had many options as to what to do with your time. The fact that you chose to join me, to listen, to be a part of this session, I really do want to say I appreciate it. We go into the word to get a word. We go into the word to show ourselves approved. Workmen rightly dividing the word of truth. If you have missed any of the episodes, please feel free to go to YouTube. Let's, L-E-T, apostrophe S, study the word. Watch, subscribe, and follow. Messages are uploaded every Thursday night. And follow, share, and like, I hope I got it right, on Facebook, where the messages are uploaded on a Monday. And until next week, God bless. Love you. And goodbye.